don't want what we know out there. How a person can go from really almost nothing to becoming a millionaire by owning rental properties. He would always buy these flip houses, and I just remember thinking, this guy is crazy. Why would he buy that house? In the past decade, there's been a huge surge in the peer-to-peer short-term rental market. Become an insider. So you have to know the rules before you get the game. Every second counts. So make every second count. Welcome to the Real Estate Jam. Whether you're just beginning or the best of the best, we're glad you're here. We will share successes, failures, and strategies for the action-taking real estate investor. And now to your hosts, JD and Melissa. Hi, guys. Welcome to the Real Estate Jam podcast. I'm JD with my wonderful co-host, me Melissa. with a bad hair day. No, so like run is crazy today. Melissa plays firefighter all day long in our business and and has been putting fires out all morning. But I think we got got to a place where we can uh, spread some knowledge and and love with the audience. Uh, I'm I'm really excited to introduce you guys to to the uh, host of my Freedom Foundry podcast, real estate uh, entrepreneur. Um, hard money lender, um, builder, pretty much a, a little bit of everything is, is what it sounds like, uh, Paul Thompson. Paul, thank you so much for finding time for us today. Um, we're really excited to have you on the show. I'm excited to talk shop. Let's do it. Let's go. Awesome. Well, for uh, those in our audience who maybe don't know who you are or haven't, haven't listened to your podcast, can you give us... Mm-hmm kind of uh, the brief synopsis of how you got started, where you're at now. And then mm-hmm. there's some really interesting topics that I hope that we can touch on in regards to uh, business ownership and running a business and that kind of stuff. But I'll let you get started. Who are you? And where'd you come from? Yeah, who am I? Uh, so <laughs> I, I live in, who am I? Yeah. I? I live in Little Rock, Arkansas, and I am a former corporate drone, spent 17 years climbing the corporate ladder, only to realize I was on the wrong ladder, or my ladder was against the wrong wall, at least. So I used real estate as a way to escape my day, day job, get enough passive income so that it could exceed my living expenses so I could buy my time back and no longer, longer rent my time to a corporation who didn't give a flying flip about me. And then I, I started my own business that cares a whole lot about me because it was me. <laughs> and so I spent my time uh, and energy trying to figure out how to become a business owner, a real estate entrepreneur, I guess you might call it. And I've tried a couple of different things. I started with single family. I have since had the scales removed from my eyes and realized that I wanted to go into uh, commercial real estate because of the, the um, scale and the economies of scale that you can get with these larger projects. Sure. Awesome. I, I do see the benefit yeah. uh, of that. And some, you know, in our experience, sometimes the smaller deals cost more time, effort, and energy than uh, the larger ones. And I'm sure that just, you know, multiplies times. The, the bigger you get. Awesome. Well, before, before we started, we, we were talking about, uh, before we started the recording, we were talking about business ownership and, and learning that song. I'm wondering if you could kind of take us through uh, the differences between what you thought it was, where it is now, yeah. and some of the stuff that you learned. A lot of people misuse the word entrepreneur, and I'm guilty of it myself. We branch out on our own, and we take this leap of faith, which is laudable and worthwhile, but you're just a self-employed business owner. You're not actually a business owner. Like You're, you're self-employed. And when you can't step away from your business and still make money, then the business still owns you. So. My whole idea was to get away from a job so I didn't have to go to work, only to you know jump right into the fire of running a business that if I wasn't there, it all came crashing down very quickly. And that's the way you start. That's absolutely the way you kind of pull yourself up by the bootstraps. But I think the, the challenge that many business owners have is that they never built, build the processes and the systems and hire the talent they need in order to effectively replace themselves so that they are truly the business owner and not the business operator. Yeah, that's a yeah. Fact. I think that's huge. Uh, the the E Myth uh, talks a yeah. little bit about this, and and that just because you're a really good uh, tactical cake builder or maker right. doesn't mean that you should sure. own a bakery. Right. Um, so 
obviously, like you said, we we have to maybe, I, I don't like using the word grind it out, but you have to put a lot of work, effort, and energy into it when you're first starting out. On the front end, yeah. Yeah, on on the on the front end, you need to actually create the business, and then once you have your processes, you start documenting. What did that journey look like for you? Terribly painful, uh, uncertain of what to do. Read all the books about it, but you just got to go and do it, and it's really hard. You guys probably recognize this: that hiring good staff and keeping them trained and keeping them in place is is a lot of work, and it just takes you know one step at a time okay here's okay i need to hire a bookkeeper that's typically i, f- I find the probably the first person most everybody should hire because you can buy a, a hire a fractional bookkeeper and you're going to pay way more for that bookkeeper than you think uh, makes sense mm-hmm. so the 20 dollar an hour bookkeeper that you get from fiverr uh that's that probably maybe works in the philippines or something might be okay, but more than likely they're not doing a very good job for you, and they're co- probably costing you more than than you, than you're saving. And I found after several years of you know painstakingly trying to get my books in order and having my you know, filing my taxes, you guys are smiling because you've been through it. Um, ha- having your um your, your you know the process of filing your taxes was so painful, and it was just all these questions. And like I don't remember what that in, what that invoice was for. I don't remember what that what that transaction was for eighteen months ago. I have no idea. And it's, you know, you know, September 14th, and we're supposed to be filing taxes and you're spending the all night long with the, you know, you, you know like we, anybody who's a business owner has done this. Okay. Uh, so a good bookkeeper eliminates all of that and saves you money in the long run. So I now have a good bookkeeper, still a fractional bookkeeper, but I pay her $55 an hour and she routinely finds things that I'm paying for that she says, like, what is this about? Like, you know, I'm, I'm seeing this recurring cost. But, oh, that's that subscription that I use to try and find deals that I was experimenting with and forgot to, to cancel. And that happens. She, so she pays for herself constantly by finding opportunities like that. And she says, you know what? You have these three entities. You have one property as an entity. And it's been that way for two years. Why, why don't you like move the entity back over here to this other entity that you've had all, all along and, or start putting new properties into this entity that you've been ignoring all this time? Like, you know, and so she's, she's, uh, almost like a partner in the business in that she's just been around for a long time and she's a lot of experience. So when we hire somebody or bring somebody in that is a, a C-level person, you don't give them room for, you don't give room for a class A excellence. So mediocrity is not going to do you any good. But if you leave mediocrity in place, you eliminate the chance for excellence. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that yeah. that's huge. Well, one of when we first started, and even even now to some extent, when we first started hiring people, you know, one we didn't know how to hire the right person, so we were hiring a whole bunch of those C C people, and right. the the really the the fundamental problem with that is the first time you hire somebody, you think, oh man, this is great. It's going to fix my business. It's going to give me more time. And so then you're really excited to start training that person. You put a lot of invest, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of energy into them. And when they're that C-level person and, and, you know, three months after you get them completely trained up and able to do the job, they decide that they're going to leave or they stop showing up on time. And then what happened for us is, is I exerted a lot of effort, energy to train that person. I didn't Mm -hmm. document my training. I didn't put these processes in in place and I started with the wrong person. So now I'm less inclined to train these people to, to put again, my time, effort and energy into building them up. And so the next person isn't trained quite as good, but they're still a C person. They're filling the spot. Mm -hmm. And then it's like this domino effect where eventually We just had to pull the plug on all of that and start over with process documentation and and documenting the the training. But I think that that number one key thing is we were too quick to hire and then also not quick enough to fire. Too slow. Yeah. So it's the reverse, right? The the, the saying of people hear it all the time, you know, be slow to hire and quick to fire. But in reality, you're you're in the weeds like you're you're running a business and you're trying to make payroll. And you're trying to, you know, cover all your, your mortgages for all these properties that you've owned and you need somebody now and you can't, you don't, you, you don't feel like you can afford to wait to hire somebody. And so the, the reality of it is that you, 
when, when every action that you're making as a business owner, you should be trying to think of it and approaching it as a exponential decision versus a linear decision. Mm -hmm. And we're all guilty of falling into this same challenge. So that's why podcasts are so powerful. It's so much better for you and I to have this conversation, have recorded so that we can now share this to the world. And I'm going to ask you guys for the recording afterwards so that I can use the video myself, myself on, my, on my own stuff, because I'm dropping off nuggets here and this is going to end up on social media someplace. Right. So, yes. right. Right. So I'm spending this time right now, uh, sharing lessons that I've learned, not in a one-to-one -one linear way, but in a one-to-many exponential way. So I can reuse it for years to come. And we should be thinking the same way with when we hire somebody, uh, when we make an investment, like how we spend our money. Or, you know, So instead of buying the flashy car, you buy all the houses that give enough revenue to pay for the flashy car if you really want that. That's the example I'm talking about when you're, we're all thinking about exponential decisions versus linear decisions. Yeah, I like that. That's really good. Absolutely. So starting a business, becoming a business owner, you got to manage your team. You got to pick, pick the right people. What are the other things that when somebody's just starting out, they're not thinking about when, when they're transitioning to having a business versus being self-employed? A lot of people who are especially self-employed or like a you know, they, they are the only employee that they have and their first employee they have. The, the challenge they often have is that uh, nobody can do it as, as good as I can. And that may actually be true, but you cannot scale infinitely. It's back to this, to this point I made a second ago. Even if you hire somebody that does something just 70% as good as, as you do, if you, if, you're a, if, you, if you have the zone of genius and you're just so good at this one thing at doing sales or, or whatever your thing is, then hiring somebody that can do it 70% as well as you could and hiring two or three, four of those people still is better than just one of you and you're being running around ragged and you're just going to crash and burn. It's not a scalable solution. So that's the problem that I see a lot of people making. The, I know the one that I made and I, I constantly catch myself that, okay, I need to hand this over to somebody and spend the time to effectively delegate, not just drop the ball on them and say, go figure it out. It's like effectively delegate it, give them processes, give them agency to go solve a problem. Yeah, absolutely. So often, and, and it happens in our business uh, for, for sure, but you become the own bottleneck. If everything yeah. has to come through you because you do that part best, then, you know, when something else comes up in your life and you're not there in the seat, it doesn't get done and that backs the whole business up and then the leads aren't mm -hmm. flowing or the deals aren't getting signed. Transaction coordination is one that we struggle with this problem yeah. a lot uh, because it, it's hard to teach somebody how to make it, it feel get through. Um, Very hard. So, and working with clients on, on the agent side of it, uh, nobody understands the market is as good as Melissa does. So, so she's the one that has, has to deal with that. And that's a really, really difficult thing yeah. for us to push off to other people, even though if we want to continue to scale and grow our business, it's something we're going to have to figure out. Yeah. And it's this really fun experiment that you can run. And I say fun in, in that it's like <laughs> a, a, a poker in the eye. Um, it's this idea of, you know what, I'm taking a vacation this summer and I'm going to be gone for three months or three weeks, let's say. So, so like each of us, maybe you guys, and I do this as well, is, okay, we're going to run a test this summer. And so the first three weeks of July, I'm going to be out of touch. And you work your way up to it, to being able to walk away. In reality, you it, it probably won't work as well as you hope, but you will spend a whole lot less time spending t solving problems and putting out fires during those three weeks. And so you'll, you'll walk away, okay, these were the five things that they called me about that I hadn't set my team up for success for, or I had trained them to rely on me when I wasn't as action necessary. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a bit of a control thing. And so, okay, you do that. And then, so you do it again, you, um, maybe for the holidays, Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas time. Okay, I'm going to step away for two weeks and the business must still run. It's a slower time. Maybe you can do some more experiments and it, make this kind of cadence in your business where you're going to test the ability to step away for two, three, four months at a time. And until you can walk away, uh, successfully walk away from your business for three months, you're still not really an entrepreneur. You're still a business owner, right? Which is fine, which is part of it. But once you, but that, that, that exercise gets you starting to think, okay, these are, th these are where I'm like self-sabotaging myself to keep myself from being a successful entrepreneur. 
Yeah, yep. that's great. I don't know that uh, I'd be comfortable with that test as of right now sure. in our business, but it's definitely something that we want to move towards. Sure. There's there's nothing worse than than setting everything up and then needing to have, you know, uh, a break, right? Uh, right? Entrepreneurs work so hard and, yep. and then step away and they're still at work. That's, you know, go to the beach and, and you're still having to, to ha handle the calls, setting your business up to, to move towards that direction. I definitely think is, is where we hope to go. It's yeah. a challenge, right? It's a challenge, but yeah. it's a, it's a really um, interesting test because you can, he, he even started off with doing it for three days or just one day a week. I actually know a guy here in town that he set it up to where he, on Tuesdays, he just didn't go to the office. He's like, figure it out. Like, you know, like, and when, when whatever he had to solve on Wednesday morning was the thing he needed to solve for so that he could not have to do that anymore. Right. So it's like a little test that you can run mm -hmm. to see how far along that continuum you are. I'm in the same spot. I have kind of this new business. If I walked away from my current businesses that I've just started, it, it would crash and burn because I haven't built it yet. Right. So it's part of the process. Yeah, absolutely. That's good. So can you tell us a little bit about like, what is, what does your team look like right now? You're, you're the visionary uh, yep. leader of the company and what's broke down underneath of you? Yeah. So I have a um, bookkeeper, a fractional, and I have a uh, operations officer who's also fractional, meaning that he's not full-time just for my businesses. And then I have uh, two business partners that are full-time. One does the land side and one does the, the lending side. And then I have a full-time virtual assistant in the Philippines that does most of our social media and like the editing of podcasts and that sort of thing. Awesome. So um, obviously those two businesses, are, those two businesses are related to each other, but they're, they're, they're not separate. Yeah, exactly the same. And I think, for 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 our listeners, one of the things that I wanted to ask you is in in regards to the hard money lending mm -hmm. and stuff. What happens to these guys when they they start out investing? They start getting hit up all the time by people who say they can lend them money and and other hard money lenders or private money lenders who come mm -hmm. out of the woodwork. And a lot of them are scams. Yep. We've known quite a few people, a handful of people who have uh, sent. Um, money to some of these hard money lenders Deposits, and never yeah. heard, heard of them from them again. I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you can kind of give us maybe some safety type uh, things to, so how do you know that a hard money lender is a hard money lender that you're talking to, yeah. you, know, you know, without it being a big and obviously a big institutional hard money lender, you're going to know, sure. but these individuals or smaller companies like yours, how do we yep. look out for scams? How do you know they're real is, uh, is you look out for a couple of red flags. One, their paperwork, they should be willing to share their paperwork with you ahead of time. So promissory note, mortgage deed of trust, that sort of thing. If that looks like something you've seen before, probably a good sign. Also, if they have an application process and they actually underwrite you, if they're not underwriting you at all, typically a red flag. They're, they're saying, yeah, we'll just give you some money. And then the the, the real trick is when when they, the, the biggest red flag is when they say, okay, now send us some money so we can then lend you money. And these are typically, it's like, Three, five, ten thousand dollars. It's not just like a hundred fifty dollar application fee or a five hundred dollar loan lock fee or something. Those are often can be legitimate uh, needs that a hard money lender would ask for. But a lot of the small ones don't do that. A small scale, you know, these you know boutique hard money lenders that are legitimate, they don't ask for money up front. They, they don't need to. They're they're running a small operation. They don't mind. They're a relationship business, and if they're not trying to get to know you, it's a really big red flag. And if they're asking for money, like big numbers, steer clear. Yeah, I think that that's great. Um, I I also think if and, and you know maybe for the hard money lender this isn't, but I, I'm not sending any money to somebody that I don't get on a phone, have a real conversation <laughs> with, be able to recognize that they're an actual adult that yeah. they're they're doing what they, they speak they English say. well. Like yeah. you know, a, a lot of these are they're overseas and they have really really choppy connections with really choppy English. It's also a bad sign. Yeah, absolutely. But they're in this, they're in the lead generation business too. You know, yeah. they, they, they're just running their sales cycle, just like anybody else. And yeah. their yeah. ultimate goal is to scam me out of 3000 bucks and never, yeah. never talk to you again. Um, great. 
Well, um, Paul, if our audience wanted to find out more about the kind of lending opportunities that you have or or mm -hmm. more about what, what you guys got going on over there, where, where can we send them? Yeah, the best place to find me is on my website, pauldavidthompson.com. I have the curse of a common name, so I have to use all of them, and they're spelled about the way you'd expect, the common spelling of Thompson. Um, and the, on all my socials, it's Paul David Thompson. Awesome, Paul. Well, we really appreciate you, you coming on. I think there's a lot of good nuggets. Um, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Thank you for listening to The Real Estate Jam. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information, check out our website, therealestatejam.com, or find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at The Real Estate Jam. If you have any questions, feel free to drop us an email at therealestatejam at gmail.com. See you next episode.